Hi, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for joining and the introduction. Um, I'll continue our session on automated feature engineering, broadening the scope a little bit, looking at, at more of the popular frameworks for automated feature engineering. But first, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Torben, working for Informationsfabrik in the lovely city of Münster, work for larger clients in the sectors of banking, insurance, manufacturing, like to help them also with automation solutions for their data. And what might be interesting for you in this context is my last year's talk at PyData, uh, which was on automating the tuning of the models of the hyperparameter settings. This year is about feature engineering. I'll give an introduction about feature. I'll add a bit more to the introduction to feature engineering. Um, I'll tell you more about popular open source tools for automating this, which I'll apply very in a very applied way in a small case study. All right, feature engineering. When we think of, uh, well, feature engineering is a very important uh, task in supervised learning. However, when we think of supervised learning, first thing that comes into mind is a dear machine learning code. Um, that actually, if we zoom out and if we want to deploy a whole machine learning system, there's many more things we have to do, starting with data collection. Sorry, I'll give you the laser pointer. But <laughs> from left to right, with data collection, we have to verify the data, clean it. Then there's feature extraction, extraction which I'll call feature engineering here. Um, the small part is our machine learning part uh, code, and then there's uh, serving and monitoring of a model. These boxes are meant to be sort of proportional to the workload that's required and also maybe to the uh, coding that's required, which is a bit sad because we just want to do machine learning and now we have to do much more programming uh, around that. And uh, even sadder because 60 years ago we were promised that machine learning would eliminate the need for detailed programming effort. Uh, but luckily to the rescue comes automated machine learning or AutoML, which we could define as eliminating the need for detailed machine learning effort. And, uh, well, here we are with AutoML options. I'll walk you from the right to the left, upstream this pipeline for where we are right now with automation. I think with monitoring, I'll give a check mark at least for the technical monitoring. If you have a model out there, see if it's alive and well. I think that can be automated. Serving infrastructure, this is what DevOps is all about. For the machine learning code itself, that's the last year's talk and, uh, and, other, way, uh, and other options, other methods. And today, we think, today we're thinking about uh, automation of feature engineering. I'm not mentioning the first two boxes. First, because they're very close to human intuition. And second, maybe we need some more material for next year. And today it's about uh, feature engineering. So what's happening there in practice with feature engineering? Starts with an engineer thinking of explanations. If we take, for example, this Kaggle data set on the Rossmann challenge, we have dates that come with uh, sales that were achieved on that day. And that's something we want to predict for the future. Uh, usually these sales are in the 5,000s. Sometimes they drop to zero, then they shoot a little bit higher, and then they settle that in the 5,000s again. So what's happening? Thinking of explanations. We first look at the base variables that come with the data set. For example, we have weekday, is the shop open, is it a state holiday? And actually for that, is the shop open? A shop open seems to be a good feature already because if it's not open, there's no sales, that zero seems to be explained. But what about the next day where the sales are a little bit higher? My explanations would be maybe it's because of a bridge day. Maybe we, people couldn't go shopping the day before. So we might want to build these variables to make it easier for the model to access this information. So we can, well, derive these variables from the previous ones. That's feature engineering. Or in other words, what's happening is there is a feature matrix in the beginning. Our engineer would uh, program some rules that would extend this feature matrix by new columns and make it more accessible for the model. So this is the current practice. Our feature engineering is often done manually. But unfortunately, right now, not all is good. I like to point out the challenges that we're facing here. The challenges, my favorite ones at least, are it's very time consuming. 
Well, you can't just sit down there as an engineer and do it. You also need the domain expertise, which sort of doubles the effort. You need more people, the experts. And when you're done creating some good features, next time you have a new prediction challenge, well, you have to do maybe the work all over again because it's not transferable to the new data set. Against this background of these challenges, I would like to come up with the small vision, also requirements for what I would like to see of, an, of, a, of a tool that gives me automated feature engineering. And these are my requirements. I want to have easy setup. Just throw in the data and get back the features. I want, to, I want it to be able to handle time in the data because I want, to, want my features to use the past to predict the future and not the other way around. I want my features, the generated features, to be self-explanatory. They should be simple enough to understand. But maybe sometimes you want to have complex features if it's adequate. You want to have maybe a high potential complexity of your features. But then again, you don't want to create all the features that are possible. You might get some noisy features that lead to overfitting. So minimal garbage features, as I'd call it. These are my personal requirements for automated feature engineering, and I'll come back to them later, checking in with the uh, available tools that I'll present, uh, how these requir requirements might be met. And then we'll look at uh, popular tools. In general, tools, and we've heard uh, in the previous talk, but well, maybe someone's, someone's new here, maybe someone clicked in on YouTube, so I'll give, uh, uh, give an introduction uh, from my point of view. In general, tools for automated feature engineering do two things. First, they generate features, potentially good features, and then they select down the best ones. More specifically, what they do, they have certain methods they can apply. For generation, popular things to do, uh, dimensionality reduction, think of PCA. Transformations, think of that feature plus the other one, or polynomial features. Relational operation, if your data is sitting across different tables, combining them with SQL-like uh, operations would be, would be options for generating features. Time series features, if your time series has a trend, you might, make a feature, might want to make a feature from that, for example. Pre-trained embeddings are a bit more complicated, but it means, in general, it would, could mean using a pre-trained model to... Uh, and uh, using a sort of a domain-specific pre-trained model to tell you more about the data you see, uh, you see in your features. For example, if you have some text in there, and uh, you can use another domain-specific model to predict you the meaning of this text as a nice handy vector that you can use at the, as a feature. Or think of transfer learning. And meta-learning is a hot topic on learning what might be good features for a new data set. You can learn this over many data sets, find out, well, in general, for this sort of data, that feature worked, and you can predict this with another model. Well, these are maybe the most popular ways for feature generation. For feature selection, fortunately, it's a bit simpler. You could split it in two. There's filtering. It's the univariate, or the you look at individual uh, features, feature candidates, and you would, for example, correlate them to your target variable and see if they contain good information, if you want to keep them. There's wrapping where with a set of all the possible features. You uh, take subsets and use them for your prediction. You reuse them with a real model, train it, get a prediction. That prediction has a quality. That quality tells you if that subset was a good one, so you can search for the best subset. That's wrapping. That are the wrapping methods. And in this landscape, these are the th three tools that are placed like this, the three tools that I would like to tell you more about. And uh, half an hour ago, in the previous talk, as a side note also, not going more into detail, we've got the details already, we learned that autofeed would be placed around here. All right. And now we can look at these tools a bit more in detail. Very, a very simple way. Feature tools helps when you have your data spread across tables. Say you'll have customers that place orders for different products that have a price. Maybe in a situation where you want to have good features on your customer from your da from the data. Feature tools gives you so-called primitives of aggregations and transformations. So you can sum up 
uh, values, you can extract a month from a date, etc. And for creating that feature, would combine them, uh, would use them in this way. You could start, for example, with the price of the products, join it to individual positions of the orders. Those positions per order you can then sum up and have price per order. You know the customer for that, so you get average again and say that customer, you, you come up with a useful feature and say that customer on average uh, usually uh, spends this amount of money for an order. That's, a use, that's one useful feature. And the only thing noteworthy, the only next thing noteworthy uh, for feature tools is that it uses all the available primitives you give it to make, create all the combinations of features with the number of steps you allow it to take you. So you get a lot of features. All right. Tears fresh. Work some time series. When you want to extract a uh, feature from a time series like this, uh, you might take a minimum, maximum, but it also gives you, as mentioned before, uh, subtle features, like the number of peaks. It has many more implemented, very well documented, can uh, create many features. And conveniently, it does not just create many features for you, it also selects them down with a filtering method. Uh, potential features are evaluated individually. They're, they're statistically tested for interaction with the target variable, ideal on your ideally on your training set, and uh, then would be discarded in a very nice, convenient way by the library um, those that don't have good interaction with the target variable. This is what TS Fresh does. Finally, Teapot takes ingredients from the scikit-learn API, namely preprocessors, selectors, and models, plus an XGBoost model, uses genetic programming for trying to find an optimal scikit-learn pipeline that combines these ingredients for going straight from the input data to making a prediction. Um, well, this is the whole pipeline, including the prediction. We're interested in like a feature, feature extraction. So one hack that could be applied here is removing from that optimal pipeline, or at least the best pipeline found, uh, removing the model in the end. And then you have a feature engineering pipeline learned by Teapot. All right, these three libraries. Next, we applied in a small, in a small case study. Goals of which were wanted to test these libraries at their default settings. Default settings because we had automation on our mind. There's many settings you can many settings uh, settings you can choose there, but let's first think of well, if we just use default, or what, what will happen? Um, we also wanted to achieve general understanding, most importantly, and compo compare the performance also a bit. For this, we gave all three libraries the same machine learning task, generate features for time series forecasting. And that's the Rossman Challenge dataset, as mentioned before. We only use an XGBoost model with fixed settings, to keep it a bit simple there. I have to mention one thing is out of scope. We're not finding out here. We cannot find out with this setting which of these libraries is the best one in general. It's about just understanding what they do and how they work. All right. And... Uh, before you get the results, I'll tell you a bit more about our design of experiments so you understand the results a bit better. The Rossman data set then, just for one store, was pre-processed, just clean, some typecasting, simple things. Then first feature generation was applied with the, uh, was, well, I don't know, was, was, was done. Feature generation was done with these th uh, three libraries, and we had one control there, just manually lagged features, a bunch of lagged features. Additionally, TS Fresh, uh, also for TS Fresh features, we also use the built in feature selection. All of these data sets were passed to XGBoost separately for training. And also, as a second control, we have no features at all, just the base features, just to see how that compares. Those separate models are then evaluated for the performance just to see how good the features are that were generated. And the very aggregated way 
the very aggregated way for these uh, for these results of, of this evaluation I'll give you here. Ha, huh, cool part is missing. <laughs> well, on the x-axis, you have the different methods. And, uh, yeah, you have the methods. On the y-axis, what you're not seeing here is the model error. That'll be the RMSE. And we have a sample size of 15, so we're varying the random seeds 15 times. You get a distribution of, uh, of that performance. What we see is, we see an order of performance here. Uh, teapot performed best, TS Fresh second, Feature Tools Manual was sort of on the same level and base was last. So the first result is fe uh, engineering features actually makes sense and helps. Um, we're curious about this convenient filtering uh, method by TS Fresh and maybe you thought maybe that's an unfair advantage. It's not just generating, it's also selecting features. So we applied this one in addition to the other feature extractors. You see this in blue here. Again, same y-axis, and you'll have uh, you'll, you'll see different things. First thing we see is that for for feature tools, you actually see an improvement. Maybe because it was the was because of the vast amount of features that were created, then filtering the best ones uh, made sense. For the other two options, we didn't see an improvement. Actually, seemed to hurt the manual features that were chosen by us, so maybe removing them uh, by coincidence uh, kind of, uh, would rather hurt. Tipo didn't see much of a change, and I think this is because, um, this might be because implicitly Tipo can learn uh, to select features in its pipeline, and uh, maybe the good ones were already selected. All right. These were the, perform are the performance results. We are also interested in what sort of features are responsible. For these, for this performance, so we might learn something there. What we're doing is we're uh, taking the base features and joining the engineered features, looking at the feature importance of XGBoost, uh, and see what sort of good features were found. With the base feature set, looks like this: we have open, day of week, uh, and state holiday are good features. With feature tools, a new variable appears here, and that's pretty much the same as we have here. That's just the weekday feature. And uh, surprisingly, they're performing similarly. Oh, well, maybe not surprisingly now. Um, T is fresh. Yes, uh, two new pe uh, features are among the, among the top ones. Uh, it's quite a cryptic way here and a fancy way expressing with an autocorrelation what day of week it is, I think. And the second one, I think, is a fancy way of saying if the shop was recently opened or closed. Uh, it's a bit cryptic, but apparently useful features. Teapot also finds a feature, but the way we used Teapot, it just has the name too. It's not very uh, expressive. But uh, it's there. It's useful. All right. And with these results, I'd like to come back to the requirements stated before. For these three libraries, very subjectively, or maybe uh, we've made the following evaluations. Was it easy to set up the tools? Generally, yes, just feature tools requires, requires you to pass the relational schema of your data. Handling time in the data? We didn't see possible with Teapot. Maybe our fault. Maybe it's not built in. Features um, being self-explanatory. We found this best with feature tools, but Teapot, we've, we've just seen that it can be uh, quite a black box. The high potential complexity of features is a mixed evaluation because I think they all of them can create quite a complexity, but in the in the domain of operations they create, uh, that they apply. Finally, the minimum of garbage features. Feature tools not that, not that strong there. And we've seen that Teapot is a bit better there. All right, these are the very zoomed in, very, very... Uh, very, very detailed results. And just finally, for wrapping it up, I'd just like to zoom out again and come back to the question, what about this, uh, what are our take-home messages here on the automation potential? So first of all, when we started something maybe noteworthy is that the preparation of the data was still required, especially because we had time-related data, making the libraries understand or 
temporal constraints there on engineering features was quite hard. So you could, you could actually mess up there if you do something wrong. Full automation we found just using the uh, default settings of the libraries definitely seem possible, but it seems to come at a cost, and that's the potential. Maybe you would be a little bit better if you just had done this, this one or two things differently. Uh, especially with feature tools, we've seen that the default settings are quite limiting, and many operations are excluded. <coughs> excuse me, are excluded with the default settings. And uh, yeah, might be room for improvement there. And you have to be aware if you use the default settings there. And finally, we might just conclude that human intervention intervention would still be beneficial, because what we've done in the steps we've taken the Original base features, applied automated generation and selection, engineering features. There's still some room for us as humans. First, there's the manual features that you could, for, ex for instance, generate before and then feed into the automation steps. And afterwards, you might want to review what, what these steps have done, at which point you might want to go back to the settings of your automated generation, maybe for selection. It might be handy to have a black and a white list to make sure which features go through and which ones don't. All right. So much about our findings. At just in this uh, on this final slide, I would like to uh, I don't know maybe ask questions to you and uh, give you some material. First of all, the code is is open for reviews and pull requests. We'd be very happy if you'd like to uh, extend it or uh, change some assumptions. There, very welcome. One question we've all, we've brought is, can we find better default parameters for these libraries? And maybe there's some open source libraries for other methods you would like to include. Maybe there's autofeed that should be included. Maybe on other methods and uh, maybe even maybe even meta learning. And of course, I'm interested for now or during the break in your opinion on uh, what you think could be best practice from combining the manual and the automated steps in feature engineering. Anything you do or you recommend, well, welcome to already mention that during the comments, <laughs> the questions, <laughs> but feel free. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tobin, for the great talk. We have time for questions. I think there was one. And yes, I'd like to remind you that questions are preferred over <laughs> comments. Hey, thank you very much for the talk. I was wondering, I didn't see on your uh, evaluation criteria something like ease of use. So thinking through those libraries, you know, something like parallelization, does it work within a scikit pipeline? Um, does it expose an inverse transform method? Do you have an opinion on which ones were easier to use than others? I think Teapot is pretty easy to use. It's very, very much fits. Uh, maybe this is the one that fits the best into uh, uh, into the Scikit Learn uh, workflow. Um, the other ones can be a bit uh, resource demanding. But I found uh, Teapot, if if you bring the time, was was the easiest to use. It was also the reason to include it. It's not a classical feature engineering uh, tool, but because it's popular with the community, that's why we included it. So if you want to go easy, maybe Teapot. Further questions? Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so my question was, you used like default parameters for the model you tested mm -hmm. on in the end. Do you think it would change like the results a lot if you did hyperparameter tuning for those? Potentially. And, uh, and what yeah. would benefit from those most maybe? Um, I'm not sure about the second part, but uh, about the first part of your question. Um, I think that that could change a lot. I mean, this uh, there could be a black swan waiting and change all the results. So there is uh, this order of performance we really have to take with a grain of salt. Yeah, but I think what we've learned about uh, uh, what's easy to use, what the f sort of features look like, uh, maybe this is more uh, generalizable. Yeah, but uh, again, welcome, welcome to uh, add just another script to our to our pipeline in the repo. Further questions? I don't see any further qu Ah, yeah. 
very interesting talk. Um, do you already have experience with the HTCSA package of Fulke with those 7,000 features? Uh, no, actually, good? actually, we, we have not, uh, have not used it so far. You mentioned it in your previous talk. Uh, um, anything you would like to let us know about this, about this library or? Um, it's just a library which includes like all the different possible features which were found, which are over 7,000. But there I would be also interested in like how does it work yeah. when you're contracted. Yeah, maybe we should edit. Yeah. <laughs> if there are no further questions, then please give another hand. Oh, no, no there's no one. one. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In your case study, TV, uh, part before best. Uh, so are there any cases where you would say, okay, uh, if you use teapot, you're screwed, basically? Mm, I think, uh, we try to, uh, cho uh, choose a da uh, data set or setting of experiment where none of these libraries had like a, like a natural advantage. If we had data spread across 10 tables, I mean, feature tools might have had a, had a natural advantage. Or if you had, um, I'm not sure if I'm seeing blue yonder on that batch there. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you use uh, TS Fresh, and you, you would have uh, an advantage if you'd have time series, like massive time series data from machines, from sensors a lot. And then such a setting, you'd have a diff uh, you'd have a natural advantage for TS Fresh. So the setting matters a lot. And you're asking why, when teapot screwed, right? When you would be screwed if uh, you use teapot or something like that. Uh, well, first thing that comes to my mind is definitely explainability. Yeah. So you, you wouldn't get this very easily with teapot. Has another question come up? Then please give another round of applause to Torben.